Well, the former president's not guilty plea has set off what's expected to be a lengthy legal battle in Manhattan. Joining me now to discuss the legal issues connected to the president's arraignment is former, former federal prosecutor Chuck Rosenberg and former Manhattan assistant district attorney Mark Agnafillo. Welcome to you both, and thanks for joining us. Chuck, I want to make sure that we understand and explain the charges here. Uh, the Manhattan district attorney, Alvin Bragg, is alleging Mr. Trump made 34 false statements to cover up other crimes. The very first line of the statement to facts reads this way. The defendant, Donald J. Trump, repeatedly and fraudulently falsified New York business records to conceal criminal conduct that hid damaging information from the voting public during the 2016 presidential election. Chuck, I just want to get your reaction to the nature of those charges. Sure, and I think I can simplify it a bit. The charges relate to a hush money scheme, payments to um, Stormy Daniels through an intermediary, Michael Cohen, and each payment to Cohen um, to reimburse him, uh, generated a number of false documents, maybe a false ledger, a false invoice, uh, a check that was falsely recorded. And so what the district attorney did was take each of those false documents, 34 in total, and charge each one as a felony under New York state law. Um, I don't think it's an inordinately complex case. I read the indictment, which is or bare bones, and a statement of facts that accompanied it, a narrative, if you will. Um, and it, it doesn't involve thousands of documents or dozens of witnesses. It's a fairly straightforward case. That doesn't mean it's not susceptible to legal and factual challenge, and I'm confident that that will happen for Mr. Trump's attorneys. Uh, but it seems relatively straightforward to me. Mark, we have, in fact, heard that argument from Mr. Trump's attorneys already. They're arguing the charges are very unusual and there's nothing there. What's your take? So it's a very typical Manhattan DA indictment for these charges. Uh, unlike a, a typical federal indictment, which is often much more of a speaking indictment, that really tells the story uh, that my colleague Chuck really just laid out for all of you. Uh, the DA's office doesn't do that as much. And, and really what they did is they just gave the bare bones legal recitation of the charge. The thing that they leave out is, is the thing that everyone's been speculating about the most. You know, what is that second, uh, what is that second offense? Um, you have to have dual intents uh, to commit these crimes. You have to have the in intent to defraud, and then you have to have to a secondary intent to, to, to aid or cover up or uh, commit another crime. And that other crime is not charged in the charging document itself, but in the in the people's statement of facts that they issued today, along with the indictment, they suggest that it's uh, it could be campaign uh, violations or tax violations. But that's not in the body of the charge. So I agree, it's a bare bones indictment. Um, but I do think that there's going to be a lot for the for the people to prove in order to prove these charges. So, Mark, just to, to see that through in more simple language, what does that mean for the bar that the prosecution has to meet? So they have to they have to find that Trump acted with specific intent, not just to commit fraud, but to violate a, a, a second statute. Um, and that's really going to be where the rubber meets the road in this case, in my opinion. The defense is going to say, as they've already said, well, he wasn't violating another statute. He was being extorted. He was being shaken down. It was a personal matter. It had nothing to do with an election. And so what the DA is going to have to prove is that it was about the election. And I think the facts that the DA alludes to in their statement of facts all relates to the timing of these things, you know, meetings that took place where there was a, a, a plot hatched, basically, to try to quell negative press, which never happened before he was running for president. So that's going to be the major factual issue as I see it in this case. So, Chuck, we now have our first details with the indictment being unsealed today. Judge Marchant set the next in-person hearing date, not until December 4th. What happens between now and then? A bunch of things, potentially. Um, for one, the uh, prosecutors have a responsibility to provide to the defendants discovery on uh, documents and witness statements and the like to help the defendants prepare the defendant prepare a case as well uh, and this is something we alluded to earlier um, the defendant will file motions challenging the legal sufficiency of the case he may seek a, a change of venue they may argue that 
there's a selective prosecution here of Mr. Trump for improper reasons, a type of uh, prosecutorial misconduct. And so defense will file their motions. They will receive their discovery. The prosecutors will respond to these various motions to dismiss. And ultimately, Judge Mershon will hold hearings and decide whether or not the case goes forward. If it does, there'll be more dates set, and they'll be even further out. Mark, I want to ask you a little bit about the team that we're going to be seeing a lot of in the months ahead. When you look at the legal teams, both the prosecution and, and the defense in this case, at the prosecution's table there on the left side of the screen, we see Chris Conroy, the man with the glasses and his hands clasped there. He's presenting most of the prosecution's case today. Behind him is a woman in a white blouse and dark jacket named Susan Hoffinger. Um, she was recently involved in another case involving the Trump Organization. Tell us about that and why she might be important to the team. So I think um, I think you hit on the two key people for the for the prosecution. Uh, Conroy and, and and Hoffinger are probably you know the heart and soul of of the DA's uh, prosecution team. Um, Hoffinger, as you pointed out, was involved in the Trump Org case. She was the lead prosecutor there. Uh, Conroy is a, a super experienced lawyer. I've had a number of fraud cases with him. Um, he's very experienced, and he's probably one of the office's go-to people. Um, so it makes all the sense in the world to see the two of them uh, at council table for a big case like this. And what should we know about the team defending former President Trump? So uh, you have Joe Tacopina and, and, and Susan Necklis. Um, I've, I've had trials with both of them. They're both very experienced lawyers. Um, Susan is a little more uh, stronger in the areas of research and preparation. Takapina is a real trial lawyer guy. You know, has been trying cases his whole his whole life. Uh, you have you have a, a, a Blanche who's new to the team, um, and he's a he's a good trial lawyer as well. Former federal prosecutor. So you have a, you have a lot of of different personalities, and I think that could work well for for Mr. Trump. But you have good lawyers on both sides. I, I, I hope that it's a well-litigated case, and I hope that it's about the case and not sort of what we call shenanigans and things that Judge Marchand does not want as part of the case. Chuck, given what we now know about the charges and what we have seen so far, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but what is the world of potential possible outcomes with these kinds of charges being prosecuted where they are? Look, there's always the chance if someone's convicted at trial uh, that they would go to jail. That seems hard to imagine, at, certainly in terms of logistics for a former president. But there's a range of things that can happen between now and then, right? I mean, we discussed the fact that the defense attorneys could file motions to dismiss. And if Judge Mershon grants motions to dismiss the indictment, the case ends there. If the case goes to trial, it's heard by a jury of Mr. Trump's peers in Manhattan. They could convict or acquit, or they could return a mixed verdict, acquitting on some counts and uh, convicting on others. So it's really sort of perilous to predict what will happen. This was the first step in what will be a maybe a painfully long journey for those of us following it closely. And uh, I'm reluctant to tell you, sitting here, what a jury would do. I didn't like to predict it in my own cases. It's even harder for me to do that in somebody else's case. A very, very long case ahead. And we thank both of you for joining us today to walk us through what we do know today. That is Chuck Rosenberg and Mark Agnafillo. Thank you to you both. Thank you.